Uh, I'm going to talk about age-based stereotype threat in the workplace, and I just want to give you a little bit of background without going into tons of detail on stereotype threat, but just in case you guys aren't familiar with what it is, um, and also just a little personal anecdote about how I became interested in it. So we moved to Australia 20 years ago, which is insane for me to imagine. Um, and when we got here, I just became acutely aware of the ugly American stereotype that we're pushy and always in a rush and all of that. And I feel like it does not describe me at all. But nonetheless, what I found myself is not wanting to speak because people would just automatically judge me that way. And so I kind of, you know, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want it to become clear, you know, my accent. And at the time, um, Steele had proposed this idea of stereotype threat as a way to understand um, different minority groups underperformance in academic context. So why do African Americans perform more poorly, even though they've been, you know, integrated, they're in the same classrooms next to white kids, they have the same teachers, everything else, why do they continue to underperform? And he said that this might be due to stereotype threat, this idea that we worry about confirming the stereotype about a group to which we belong. And at the time, it was a lot of lab-based work. It was all, all lab-based work trying to understand performance decrements. Um, but as an org psych, this kind of got me um, interested in thinking about that it probably has consequences beyond performance in a laboratory context. It's uh, impacting my day-to-day -day existence in Australia because I'm too... Um, I'm worried that people are going to judge me on this ugly American stereotype, and so I'm not speaking out. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of sense, I am going to only be talking about age-based stereotype threat, but just to give you a little bit of sense of how um, the kinds of things that are happening, like well, when you say stereotype threat, what do you mean? Um, most of my work has actually been with women in male-dominated fields, and I've done a little bit on men in female dominated fields, but these are the kinds of things that people are saying. So I had a big disagreement with my boss. He upset me so much. I left and had a bit of a cry. I felt weak and girly. I think he thought of me as a weak woman at the time and it was distressing for me. So essentially it's not this clear cut discrimination. Um, it's just these more subtle kinds of things that are happening. She doesn't know, maybe her boss just felt really guilty. Like, oh my gosh, you poor little munchkin. I'm so sorry, I didn't, you know, and like, who knows? Maybe he didn't even notice, but it's our concern that people might be evaluating us on the basis of this stereotype. Um, obviously, it's not as common for men, but we've done some work with men in um, primary school teaching and also male child protection workers, and they also are feeling stereotype threat that people are judging them that, you know, because masculine characteristics are inconsistent with the kind of more caring and sympathetic, um, compassionate role that you would take as a child protection worker or as a primary school teacher, they also are feeling that they're being judged on the basis of their stereotypes about their um, group. So um, the thing is that, like I mentioned at the start, that most of the stereotype threat work that was taking place at the time, or in fact, all the stereotype threat work that was taking place at the time was in the lab. People were told very explicitly, like, oh, because women tend not to perform as well in these tests of math. Um, nonetheless, despite that, we want you to try your hardest so that we can get an accurate sense of your math ability. So it's very like explicit in your face kind of situation, um, the way that they've manipulated stereotype threat. But my experience as an American in Australia made me realize that it can be very subtle things um, that can be taking place that might um, drive us to experience stereotype threat, and that it doesn't necessarily need to be performance-based. And this is consistent with, St with Steele's original theorizing, although the work 98% of the work has looked at these performance decrements. If you look at his original theorizing, what he says is that over time, if people continue to accumulate these stereotype threat experiences in a particular domain, they might start to disidentify or disengage from the domain. And so from an org site perspective, if you start to disengage um, in the workplace, then that is going to lead to more negative job attitudes, poor workplace well-being. You'll be less engaged more generally. And so 
in the work that I've been doing um, and what the work I'm going to present today across five studies is, well, what are the consequences of stereotype threat, particularly for older employees? That's the focus today. What are the mechanisms that might be driving this effect? And then also, we just did a study looking at a moderating mechanism, and I saw, I don't see him now, but I saw Alex was on here earlier. That final study I'm presenting is work that I've collaborated with Kath based on the OSEM that um, Alex and Kath and Nick, I think, was on there as well. I think he's been involved in that work. Um, and so, Alex, I can't see you, but if you're out there, um, be sure to correct me if I say anything wrong, because I'm a bit nervous about presenting this work that obviously I know, like, I can just scratch the surface on the social identity literature, but that's what the moderator will be. So, like I said, what we're doing is we're going beyond the performance decrements that have been primarily studied, almost exclusively studied, and looking instead at disengagement in the workplace. So, um, and I'll focus uh, on older employees. I think older employees are a really interesting group because you guys may have heard that there's this impending labor shortage that industrialized countries are all concerned about, which is essentially that people are having fewer kids. Um, we realize that they're exhausting and they're expensive and we don't need them to help on the farm anymore. Um, and so we're having fewer children. COVID has in fact made that much worse. I was just reading how birth rates in the US have like plummeted with COVID, no surprise there. Um, and it's also the case that we're living longer. So this combination of fewer kids and living longer means that we might have this labor shortage um, in the future. And in fact, Australia has been really proactive at developing um, various incentives and policies to keep people in the workforce for longer. Um, and I believe that by like 2037, I don't remember the exact dates, you might know, this is Sophie's PhD, it's all about age-based stereotype threat, and I'm not presenting any of her work today, because um, you can do that next year. <laughs> um, is we're gonna have the oldest retirement age in the world. So um, we get to work for 70, basically. Yes. By the time you guys get to that point, you might be working for even longer. <laughs> um, so this is, I think, you know, an interesting area because we're concerned about um, keeping older employees in the workforce, but if they're experiencing stereotype threat and then they, therefore they disengage, well, we might have a bunch of warm bodies in the workforce, but they may not be working to their potential because of the stereotype threat that they're experiencing. Um, they might disengage or you know, worst case scenario is that they might actually er retire earlier than they would. So this is what we're looking at. And I should say that the reason we think it's relevant is that there's lots of stereotypes about older employees. So they're less pr productive, they're less willing to learn new technologies, they're resistant to change. The reality is that most of the research or maybe all of the research has demonstrated that there aren't any real differences in performance between older and younger employees, but the reality of the stereotype doesn't actually mean, if you know that it's not true, um, that doesn't mean you won't experience stereotype threat. And so for me, for example, I'm like the opposite of this pushy, loud, I hope you guys agree with that, aggressive American, and yet I still worry that people are gonna like, you know, peg me as this, you know, crass American. Um, so this is why we think that stereotype threat would be really relevant um, in the workplace. So, and just again, to give you an example of the kinds of things that participants have, sh have shared with us, um, here's an older employee, employee saying he feels that people think he's no longer in touch, um, even though he has all this specialist knowledge, which means he has a good understanding of the area. But because the organization prides himself as being innovative and cutting edge and everything else, um, it's, he thinks that anyone over 40 um, maybe is perceived as not having ideas worth listening to. I think the over 40, that's very young. And in fact, in our, my earlier studies, we were looking at people who are 50 and above. And in the last study I'm presenting, we did 55 and above, because as you'll see, um, and maybe due to the aging workforce, um, we definitely, I think it's great. I'm very happy as a newly 50 year old that like I, people who are 50 are not old yet um, in the workplace from what we can tell. 
So the general idea that we're um, looking at is this notion that to the degree that older employees experience stereotype threat, they should have more negative job attitudes. So their affective commitment will be lower, their job satisfaction will be lower. And of course, based on what we know in the literature, that to the degree that people have more negative attitudes, they might be more interested in quitting their jobs. And ultimately, might they be more interested in retiring? Now, I think that's a really difficult um, link to try to find because, of course, so many people are financially de dependent on their job. And as a consequence, even though you might want to retire early, you may not be in a posi position to do so. So, but it's an empirical question. We shall see. So in this first study I want to tell you about, we teamed up with an Australian media company. Um, it's much easier to go to large organizations because when you're looking at gender, it's much easier because you have like nearly 50% of the workforce unless you're going into engineering or something like that it tends to be female. But when you're looking at just older employees, it can be difficult to get a large enough sample of older employees if you, unless you go to a quite large organization. So we went to a large Australian media company and we looked at people 50 plus. Um, and we just did a really brief online survey where we measured the degree to which they experienced stereotype threat. So a sample item would be, um, I, you know, people think that I'm less capable because of my age or I'm less committed because of my age, five items um, around, along those lines. It turned out um, quite, I guess it was, we didn't plan this, but it wound up working out to our advantage. If you look at those items, they actually are also equally relevant to young employees, which I'll get to in a bit. And then we just looked at sort of standard job satisfaction, affective commitment scales. The workplace well-being scale you might be less familiar with. It's WARS measure where we say, over the past two weeks, how much of the time has your job made you feel each of the following? And there are six positive, six negative words. We reverse score the negative so that the higher scores are higher workplace well-being. So, you know, how much of the time has your job made you feel tense or stressed or I don't remember the words, but it's along those lines. Um, we looked at turnover intentions and then retirement intentions. And again, these are all really standard scales that are used in the literature except for the stereotype threat scale, which we adapted from my earlier work on women and men in male dominate in female dominated professions. Okay, and so then what we did because we had a large enough sample size is we used structural equation modeling to see is in fact stereotype threat associated with these negative workplace outcomes or negative job attitudes and well being more um, specifically and if that in turn then would lead to turnover intentions and retirement intentions. And if the pattern worked out, well, what you can't see here is that not surprisingly, job satisfaction, commitment, and workplace well-being were all correlated with one another. Um, but essentially, stereotype threat was associated with more negative job attitudes, poor workplace well-being. And those in turn were related to turnover intentions um, and retirement intentions in this study. I will never replicate this again. So savor that because mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Um, workplace well-being, though, did not relate to turnover intentions and retirement intentions. And so it was a better fit if we just dropped that out of the model. But so this is some promising, well, not promising for older people, but in terms of supporting the theory. Um, that stereotype threat is associated with these disengagement consequences, which in turn are um, associated with greater intentions to leave the organization. And so we just replicated this study with a completely different industry. So we um, teamed up with Australian, an Australian law enforcement agency, and we just used the same exact measures from the previous study. Um, and we essentially replicated almost everything except for retirement intentions. Um, and so again, workplace well-being isn't associated with um, the leaving the organization intentions, whether that's turnover or retirement, um, but we've got stereotype threat being associated with these negative workplace outcomes, which in turn um, are leading to more in, intentions to quit your job. 
So when we first got this, I thought, oh, maybe it's because up until not that, you know, like somewhat recently, there had been a mandatory, mandatory retirement age in the police force. And so maybe that was why it was dissociated, but I don't believe that anymore. I think we just got lucky with that first study because we've included it in a couple of other studies um, and we don't, do we have retirement intentions in any of your studies or was just like, yeah, let's not. Yeah, we, yeah. we dropped that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe we gave up on it prematurely, but anyway. But I have alluded to earlier this notion and you guys as, as young people, um, not you, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's lots of stereotypes about younger people as well. And so, you know, I know that imposter syndrome is a thing, but for the, irrespective of imposter syndrome, like younger employees are seen as less committed. They want everything handed to them on a silver platter. They're less capable so on and so forth. So is this something unique about being an older employee and experiencing stereotype threat or are younger employees susceptible to the same disengagement consequences? And in fact, do younger employees experience stereotype threat at all? We don't know. Um, and so we did another study in which we included um, both younger and older workers, and everything was the same, except in this study, we removed retirement intentions because we were trying to keep it exactly the same. Like we didn't, we didn't ask people's age at the beginning and then type them to a different survey. They got the identical survey. And then at the end, we asked their age. And so we didn't want to have retirement intentions in there because it would seem very odd if you're 22 years old and you're asking people about their intentions to retire. The other thing is that we included a job status measure, um, and that was just this ladder here. Um, I think Qualtrics has recently been updated, and maybe we can start to do something a little bit nicer, but we just say to people, um, you know, this is the bottom of the hierarchy, this is the top of the hierarchy, like CEOs, this is entry level, and just where do you think you fall on that hierarchy? And they just slide it um, up and down. You're here to yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so to so, so, <laughs> so I originally saw you come up and I was like, okay. <laughs> but no, I'm so delighted that you're here in person. So when we get to the OSIN, you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> but I'll come up and take over for you. Um, so those are the only changes that we made. So then the question is, are younger employees also experiencing stereotype threat? And it turns out that our younger employees actually experience significantly more stereotype threat than our older employees. So, you know, they feel that people believe they're less committed and um, less capable because of their age. Um, but does it relate to these disengagement consequences? So I'm first going to show you the results with our older employees. Um, and here we replicate the same pattern that we have been where, again, workplace well-being isn't associated with turnover intentions, but to the degree that they're experiencing stereotype threat, they're less satisfied, less committed, they have poor workplace well-being, and job set and commitment in turn are associated with turnover intentions. And these models, um, I haven't been mentioning this, but they all have good fit and so on and so forth. Um, but what do we see with our younger employees? Well, stereotype threat is completely unrelated to these workplace outcomes. It has no impact on their job satisfaction, no impact on their commitment, no impact on their workplace well-being. I should mention that these are intercorrelated in the way that we would expect. So it's not like our young employees just didn't take the survey seriously. And we still get a relationship where to the degree that they're not satisfied and not committed, they have more interest in quitting their job. So everything else is working the way that it should be. It's just that stereotype threat, they experience it. In fact, they experience more of it but it has no disengagement consequences for our younger adults, our young employees. And the question then is, well, why is that the case? And so this is where it's so good to write a paper and you get stuck writing a discussion section. This was my feedback the other day for you. This is where it stemmed from. I'm like, why is this, you know? And so we started thinking about some ideas, um, which we put into the discussion section, which we then 
have subsequently tested, which I'll present in a moment. But we were thinking about things of like, when you're young, you know that everyone else has been there before you, that you're naturally going to age out of this stereotype. And so as a consequence, when you feel that somebody thinks you're not as capable or you're not as committed, you might feel that that's a challenge. You might appraise that stressor as a challenge, like, oh yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you how committed I am. I'm gonna be there at 7 a.m. every day this week. Um, or, you know, that you show them that you're capable. So maybe what's happening is younger employees are more likely to appraise stereotype threat as a challenge, whereas older employees, Encroaching retirement, getting older, that like that's just your every year it gets worse, right? You're not gonna naturally age out of it. It's just gonna become more, it's gonna have more of an impact. It's it's um it's not going away. And so maybe for them what's happening is that they're more likely to appraise it as a threat. Now, so I'm focusing on sort of the challenge threat appraisals from Lazarus and Folkman, but in the OrbSec literature, instead of calling them a threat appraisal, they oftentimes use the term hindrance. I'm going to stick with the term hindrance appraisal because I feel like it's confusing to have stereotype threat leads to a threat appraisal. But the idea with a hindrance appraisal or a threat appraisal from that literature is that you feel that this is an obstacle that you can't overcome. You feel that you don't have the resources to successfully deal with it. So maybe the reason it's not problematic for young people, but it is problematic for old people is that they fundamentally appraise a stereotype threat event differently. Um, so that's one thing that we tested, partial support. The other thing that we tested is, might it be the case that what happens when you're an older employee and you experience a stereotype threat event, you're more likely to ruminate on it. Now, we know, for example, that as our executive con control diminishes, so a natural part of aging is that you have poor executive control. Um, one aspect of executive control is inhibitory ability. So the ability to inhibit thoughts, put it out of your mind. So it might be the case just as part of the natural aging process that we lose that ability to put something out of our mind because we have poor executive control. In other words, we're more likely to ruminate on it. So maybe when a stereotype threat event happens, a young person thinks, I can't believe my boss said that. I'm gonna, you know, I'll show him or I'll show her like I'm just as capable. And then that's it. They put it out of their minds. They don't ruminate on it. Whereas maybe what's happening with older employees is they're more likely to perseverate on the event that happened. Like, I can't believe my boss asked me if my health was okay. He clearly thinks I've got one foot out the door. I feel like I'm using this sexist language where I keep assuming the boss is male. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm a product of my time. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the general idea I kind of am getting ahead of myself. So results with our older employees were consistent with the earlier studies, but stereotype threat was unrelated to those disengagement consequences for younger employees. And the question is, why might that be the case? And this is everything that I just explained to you. Um, I'll just walk you through a couple other little nuanced things in the model. We expect that um, worker age and this degree to which they experience stereotype threat. In this study, we're using a diary study, so we're actually looking at stereotype threat events. Those stereotype threat events, though, were highly correlated with that more chronic measure of stereotype threat that we've used in all the other studies. Um, but we expect there to be this quadratic relationship whereby younger and older employees should be experiencing more stereotype threat events, and middle-aged employees should be experiencing fewer stereotype threat events. So that's why we've got this curved line here. But the basic idea is that we're expecting these stereotype threat events um, to lead to different types of appraisals and rumination as a function of worker age. So we're gonna have this interaction between the stereotype threat event and workers age, whereby younger employees should be more likely to appraise it as a challenge. Older employees should be more likely to appraise it as a hindrance and older employees also should be more likely to ruminate. Well, if you see it as a challenge, you can't overcome, it's a hindrance, and you're ruminating on it, that in turn should be mediating our various workplace outcomes that we've been looking at before. Um, whereas if you appraise it as a challenge, then it shouldn't negatively impact your engagement. So does that all make sense? Okay. So 
the way that we did this um, is we looked at um, 280 employees from 18 to 66. We used employees across the age spectrum. We kind of went back and forth. Should we just use younger or should and like have two separate groups, younger and older? Um, but in the end, we just decided that reviewers might get on our case if we don't have people across the age spectrum. Um, we weren't necessarily sure where that age cutoff would be. Um, and, you know, age is a continuous variable, so it's a little bit weird to arbitrarily say, oh, 30 and below, you're, we now classify you as young. Um, but anyway, so I think that made our results not as strong and as clear as a consequence. I think if we just used our young and old, we would have um, clear results. But what we had was a weekly diary design over five weeks. We had excellent compliance. So we had 4.39 diaries completed each week. That's because we paid our employees um, to do it. And you, yeah, so that's really helpful when you have the capacity to do that. And at the beginning of each week, we presented them with, I'll show you this. We said sometimes in the workplace, people feel that they're being negatively evaluated based on their membership in a group. For example, some people feel that their age group may impact how people treat them at work. Over this past week at work, have you been judged negatively based on your age? And then they said yes or no. And if they said yes, then we asked them to write out a little bit about what happened. We subsequently got that coded. There were no differences between the kinds of events that young and old were describing in terms of there's like this stressor um, categorization thing that you can use that puts it into different categories. And so in that respect, they weren't different. Obviously, young people weren't saying like, oh, I felt that my boss was asking me about retirement and blah, blah, you know. So there were differences in that regard, but they were categorized in the same kind of way. Um, obviously, a lot of people are going to say no each week, or they may sometimes say no. Um, and so there were, what we did if they said no, and we did this for two reasons, is we asked them about a stressful event at work. Um, and I say we did this for two reasons. It's firstly, I have a lot of experience with participants trying to like slack off in the study. Um, and my concern was that if they learn that if they say no, the study ends, well, then they're, you know, motivated to not admit that something had happened. So that was part of it. But the other part is I just felt that reviewers might say to us, well, maybe it's nothing unique about stereotype threat. Maybe it's just stress in general. And older employees are more likely to ruminate on stress. And older employees are less likely to appraise it as a challenge and more, like, more likely to appraise it as a hindrance. So to overcome what I anticipate our reviewers saying, um, we thought that this was a good idea to have this like control event, so to speak, where they just talked about a stressful event instead. And it is the case that stereotype threat is considered a stressor. So we're looking at like a very particular kind of stressor versus just a regular stressful event. And so the kinds of things that employees talked about were um, impending merger and they were worried about downsizing and losing their job with the merger. Um, some of the stressful events were like very random, like somebody, you know, had a tooth removed and they had a lot of discomfort, like, and that was impacting their ability to concentrate in the workplace. So there were just like a ton of different kinds of stressful events that people reported. Very occasionally, people also said they had no stressful event at all. And I really, truly wanted to like get in touch with these people and find out about their life so that I could then say, you know, all right, if you want to experience no stress in your life, this is what you do. But most people could recall a stressful event. So, um, just if you want a little bit more um, like fleshed out, these are the kinds of events that they experience. So younger employees, you know, feeling like they're being questioned because they're young or people doubting their knowledge. So the kinds of things that you would expect. Um, and here's the kinds of things that older employees are saying. So consistent with our expectation, this is just looking at the percentage of stereotype threat events. So because there were five diaries, somebody could have five stereotype threat events or somebody could have zero stereotype threat events. 
Um, and we get this curvilinear relationship whereby our younger and our older employees are experiencing more stereotype threat events. Again, younger employees are experiencing more stereotype threat than our older employees. Um, so really um, nice to see when we're replicating our earlier results. Um, in terms of age as a moderator, we're and again, this isn't across the board, so we didn't find it for all of our outcome variables, um, but essentially, and I'll walk you through this, we've got the stressful event versus the stereotype threat event, and we've got um, older employees are the, the dash line. And so what we're seeing is that when older employees, we'll just start up here, when they experience a stereotype threat event relative to a stressful event, their job satisfaction is decreasing, their job engagement is decreasing, their workplace well-being is decreasing, and they're more likely to um, ruminate on that stressful event. But we're not seeing that same pattern with young employees. Young employees, the stereotype threat event relative to the stressful event, it's like impacting their job satisfaction pretty similarly, um, et cetera. So hence the more flat line for our younger employees. One of the issues here is that well, you guys might know when you decompose that interaction, you're looking at it at one standard deviation above and below the mean. But because we use the whole age spectrum, like 18 to whatever it was, our young and our old were not actually what we would typically consider like proper young and proper old. And so in retrospect, I feel like we should have analyzed the data differently. Um, maybe making an argument for why we're not doing it at one standard deviation below and above and instead using, you know, one and a half standard deviations. But I didn't think about that at the time. And so this is the story um, that I can share with you. So we did moderated mediation. Um, and now I'm just showing you in terms of the moderated mediation, again, similar to what we've been showing previously for younger employees, um, we just weren't finding any effects of stereotype threat on disengagement. We also did not find that younger employees were more likely to appraise it as a challenge um, when stereotype threat happened. There just really was not a whole lot happening with the younger employees. With, so these um, conditional indirect effects are just for our older employees. And what we find is that to the degree that they experience the stereotype threat event, they had lower challenge appraisals. So it's not that they were more likely to see it as a hindrance, it's that they were less likely to see it as a challenge. Stereotype threat event happens and I don't, I don't perceive it as a challenge. I don't perceive it as a way for me to prove myself and show myself. They're less likely to do that. Then as a consequence, because you're not to the degree that you were to pre, um, appraise it as a challenge, you're more engaged and more committed and you have lower intentions to quit. Um, we have a similar pattern of results with rumination. So again, these are just the conditional indirect effects for older employees only. To the degree that they experience a stereotype threat event, they're more likely to ruminate on it. And that rumination is then what's driving them to have, be less satisfied, have lower workplace well-being, and be less, more likely to quit. Does that all make sense? Okay, so Alex, pay attention now. <laughs> so we have a pretty consistent pattern, I would argue, that older employees who experience stereotype threat are disengaging in the workplace. And one of the things, of course, as academics that we want to do is, well, how can we fix this problem? And several years ago, um, Alex gave a talk where he talked about this social identity mapping tool. It wasn't online at the time. It was like little sticky notes. And so, um, and I talked to Alex at the time, um, but I think we were both really busy. And then one thing led to another. And then Yolanda mentioned to me that Kath had done, this is like the whole history here. Kath had actually done stereotype threat work with older um, employees, like not employees, sorry, older adults, like in retirement homes and things like that. And so I chatted with Kath. Kath and I wrote an ARC discovery grant, and this is, um, has come out of that discovery grant. This is a study that we ran um, this year with my team thesis group. We met in this room every Friday. Um, so I feel like I'm coming home and there is Smudge. So she did go to, she did attend thesis 
workshop with me. Um, but the idea is that can we harness the benefits of our social identities? So um, there's been decades of research showing the benefits of our social identities and how um, various aspects of our social identities can be really beneficial for our health and well-being. Um, and what the online social identity mapping tool enables researchers to do is to use various, like you would look at these things in isolation. So belongingness to the group or support from the group or positivity from the group. But the online social identity mapping tool allows you to integrate these various social identity processes. And we can see, is it the case that to the degree that you have this lovely resource, this social capital, these social connections, um, will that buffer you from the negative consequences of stereotype threats? So it's basically just a simple moderation model where you know, older employees are experiencing stereotype threat, we expect it to make disen you know, lead to disengagement, but can we weaken that process if people have really good social identity capital? <laughs> so that's what we looked at. And we had 341 employees who were 55 plus. So we, again, because just based on some other data that I've been seeing, um, like looking at it, it just seemed like 50, 50 is the new 40. And so we really needed to bump up the age. Um, and they did, it was probably more like a 25 on 25 minute online survey. And we, there were just a couple changes. One, obviously, is we implemented implemented the OSAM, the Online Social Identity Mapping Tool, which I'll show you in a moment. And we also, instead of looking at that workplace well-being, the measure that I described earlier, that's really highly correlated with job satisfaction and commitment and intentions to quit. So I just thought, you know, might experiencing stereotype threat impact you in other aspects of your life as well? And so we use that same exact measure, but instead of saying, over the past two weeks at work, we say, over the past two weeks outside of work, how much of the time have you felt each of the following? And they said tense and so on and so forth. So the same measure, but talking about outside the workplace. So this is what the um, social identity mapping tool looks like. I was gonna try to, we had trouble getting everything set up, so I didn't test the link, so I'm not gonna do it now, but my students, we, they made a super adorable video where it starts out there in front of this wall and they say, thank you for helping us graduate. And then they walk through how to do the online social identity mapping, like, you know, click on here and do this and do that. Um, and it's really adorable. And this is what it looks like. You basically click on these little, what looks like a post-it note and you assign, um, you describe what the group is, so workmates or gym or evening classes. Um, and so we give them information at the beginning, like to get them thinking more broadly about the different groups in their life. And then you answer a series of questions about each group. The sticky notes, you can make small, medium, or large, depending on how important that group is to you. Um, and then you can also link up your groups. So a green would indicate that these really coincide. They're quite compatible with one another. Our participants had a bit of trouble with the linking. And so I'm not going to talk about the links today. So with each group, um, they then answered some questions. So that was the bottom bar in the sticky notes. And the first thing that we ask them is, is this a group in your workplace, my students, if any of you, and would you mark some of my students? So I was hoping that they were gonna think to do this, but none of them did. And so I was analyzing the data. Um, yeah. Anyway, so we asked them, is it a group in the workplace? And then how positive, how much they feel they fit or they belong, and how much support. So these are the three things I'm gonna focus on. Um, into this measure of what's called supergroups. So this is, in, this is from um, their, Alex's earlier work and Kat's earlier work and Sarah Bentley um, and some other people, but a supergroup is basically a group that is high quality and meaningful to the person. Um, and it is integrating these indices of supportiveness, belonging, and positivity, along with those compatibility links. But, our compatibility links, um, we're gonna leave them out because we wind up losing 70 participants who didn't link them properly. 
But if we correlate, if we do it exactly how they did it in their previous work with leaving it out, they're super highly correlated with one another. Um, and so then what happens is where you say like how positive, how much you belong, um, how much support you get from the group, the way that it is um, calculated is if they rated that group above the midpoint on that measure. So this isn't anything that I made up. This is exactly how they've done it before, and this is how we pre-registered it. And so we can look at how many supergroups participants had, um, their mean number of work supergroups, and their non-work supergroups. So the vast majority of groups that people just naturally um, provided us were non-work groups, even though we did definitely make a sense, we made a point of saying, you know, the groups in your workplace. And in the sample map that we gave them, we had several sample workplace groups, but nonetheless, when people think about their groups, they seem to think about non-workplace groups, it seems. So the key is, did we moderate? So this is the last study, I'm almost done. Um, did supergroups provide this buffer from the disengagement consequences of stereotype threat? And the bottom line is that yes, they did. So this is, I should mention, it was only older employees. So because we've been consistently showing that to the degree younger employees experience stereotype threat, it doesn't impact on disengagement. There's no effect there to moderate. So I just thought it was better for us to really focus our energies on the group that we're trying to show or demonstrate um, or test if supergroups are going to buffer um, the negative consequences of stereotype threat. So we have low supergroups as the solid line. So those are one standard deviation below the mean on supergroups. High supergroups, one standard deviation above the mean. They're small effects, but they're reliable. These are significant interactions. So when you experience low levels of stereotype threat, you're number of groups don't make any difference at all. But for our participants who are experiencing more stereotype threat, to the degree that they have lots of good supergroups, they have more supergroups, their job satisfaction, sorry, that's the dashed line here. I was like, that's opposite. It's the dashed line is the high supergroups. To the degree that they're um, experiencing high levels of stereotype threat, having more supergroups helps buffer them from that negative consequence of stereotype threat. So their job satisfaction is significantly higher. Um, and we get the same pattern with organizational commitment and then intentions to quit. Um, this goes the opposite direction because in the more stereotype threat you experience, um, your intentions to quit are higher. And so now I've confused myself. Those super groups, solid. Yes, so their intentions to quit aren't going up to the same degree that they are if they have those supergroups. Um, so then the question is, well, does it matter if it's a workplace supergroup? Um, and might it be like this is something that's happening in the workplace? Maybe the workplace supergroups are particularly important. I think we don't have the best test of this because we had so few workplace groups even being identified in the map. But nonetheless, even just having that one workplace supergroup seems to be beneficial. Um, we're replicating those results on job satisfaction and organizational commitment. Um, so if they're not up here, that means we didn't show that effect on, in this case, um, intentions to quit. But when we look at non-work groups, then we show the same pattern of results um, as earlier. So to the degree that they have high supergroups, that's buffering them from these, when they experience lots of stereotype threat, their job satisfaction isn't as negatively impacted, their commitment's not as negatively impacted, and their intentions to quit aren't increasing as much. So um, that's it, I just wanna put that up. Um, Sophie has been taking a very different look, so trying to look at what is happening. What are those experiences in the workplace that are actually leading older employees to experience stereotype threat? And looking at age salience as the mediating mechanism. So when these things happen, it brings your age to the forefront of your mind. And it's feeling now that your age is so front and center that is leading to um, these experience to stereotype threat. And she's doing some, lots of super exciting stuff as well that I'm not going into because she'll talk about it all next year. 
Um, and yeah. Thank you.